Hello, I'm Thomas Keel, Senior Applications Engineer with Texas Instruments Precision Analog Operational Amplifiers Group. Today we're going to take a look at the effect of electromagnetic interference on the operation of precision analog integrated circuits. EMI, electromagnetic interference, is often a source of radio frequency disturbance. It's the subset of radio frequency interference as where radio frequency interference may be an actual intended radio frequency uh, transmission. Often RFI is narrowband in nature while EMI is broadband in nature. These terms are often used interchangeably. They can cause RF spectrum pollution, circuit malfunction, and violate federal regulations. It can disturb the performance of precision analog circuits. Sources of electromagnetic energy include intentional radiators such as cell phones, transmitters and transceivers, wireless routers, peripherals, personal wireless electronics, and industrial wireless electronics. Unintentional radiators often include system clocks, oscillators, processors, and logic circuits, especially those having fast rise and fall times, switching power supplies and amplifiers, electromechanical devices, and electrical power supply line services. In our circuit, we may have an operational amplifier operating in a particular gain, and all we really expect to see is a response from the sensor that's attached to it. Often these sensors operate at relatively low frequencies within the bandwidth of our circuit. That can be anywhere from DC to a few megahertz. EMI, on the other hand, may be at any frequency, including up into the gigahertz. Three elements are necessary for EMI to take place. First, we have to have a receptor, a circuit that's sensitive to the particular frequencies contained in the EMI. Then we have to have a source, be it either conducted EMI, something that is directly connected via wires to our circuit, be it data lines or power supply lines, or over here on the right-hand side of the screen, it can be a radiated EMI, where the source is actually something transmitted, coming off of an antenna or a wire in our circuit then there has to be a coupling meeting between that source of EMI and the receptor. It can be either in the case of conducted EMI, the wires themselves, or in the case of radiated EMI, the, the air or the space around or between the antenna and the receptor. The effect on our analog circuits is varied. Most common though with our low speed operational amplifiers, this involves an offset shift. An op amp has an inherent offset and when EMI is present, if the circuit is sensitive to it, we'll see that the offset moves in value. There may also be some RF noise coupling to the output of the amplifier. It may be very small, and it's due to just coupling across the integrated circuit die. High-speed amplifiers may also take on an offset shift, and because of their wider bandwidth, may have linear or nonlinear amplification. Converters, because of their wide band bandwidth input sections, EMI may be aliased into the passband, corrupting the output levels or output codes, may also take on an offset shift. Regulators, though they don't have an input pin, do have power supply and output pins. And if the EMI gets in on those pins, the same sort of thing happens. We have an offset shift, which causes the output voltage to move. The reason that this offset shift occurs is because of rectification internal to the operational amplifier. If we look at a simplified circuit for an operational amplifier, we have the differential input stage. In this particular case, it's two NPN transistors. It could be CMOS input stage, it could be JFET. But nonetheless, with the base emitter and the base collector junctions, we have built-in diodes. There are also ESD diodes, protection diodes, on the input of the device. Any of these can serve as a rectifier. The RF coming in will be high in frequency usually, hundreds of megahertz or gigahertz, and this is rectified by one or more junctions. Now the operational amplifier has a low bandwidth relative to the frequency at the input, and it will filter the pulsating DC re resulting from the rectification, and what we see is an amplified DC offset at the output. This is a sweep across frequency for an OPA376 CMOS operational amplifier. On this scale, we have frequency going from 10 megahertz to about 5 gigahertz. And on this scale, we have a relative offset on the device, and it's the DC offset change that we're monitoring. 
What we do is we apply three different levels of RF to the input. Minus 10 dBm, 0 dBm, and plus 10 dBm. In a 50 ohm system, minus 10 dBm represents 100 millivolts peak. 0 dBm, 318 millivolts, and plus 10 dBm, 1 volt peak. We see that in the case of this upper line, minus 10 dBm, as we sweep frequency, we see almost no change in the voltage offset seen at the output. Now the circuit is in a very high gain, so we can detect any kind of an offset change. When we increase the level to 0 dBm, we now see at lower frequencies, we're getting as much as 100 millivolt change at the offset. That tapers off as we increase the frequency. By time we increase the input to plus 10 dBm, we see that there's a very large change in the offset. A new term has been added to the parameter list for operational amplifiers. That's EMIRR. EMI rejection ratio. It is a measure of quantifying an operational amplifier's ability to reject EMI. It was defined in National Semiconductor's application note 1698. It is measured as a dB voltage ratio of output offset voltage change in response to an injected RF voltage having a defined level. It provides a definitive measure of EMI rejection across frequency, allowing for a direct comparison of the EMI susceptibility of different operational amplifiers. In the illustration of the operational amplifier, we show RF being applied to the input pins, to the output pin, and to the supply pins. Measurements have shown that the most sensitive pins are the input pins, as we would expect. EMIRR is now measured on the input, and we measure that on the non-inverting input. This equation in decibels relates the RF peak voltage applied to the shift in voltage offset and the RF peak applied to the 100 millivolt or minus 10 dBm level. The most important thing about this is higher EMIRR means lower amplifier EMI sensitivity. So what you really want in the particular case of an EMI sensitive situation is an amplifier that has high EMIRR. If we take this equation and rearrange it just in terms of the offset shift, an interesting outcome is that we have the squared term relative to the peak RF voltage applied. This is a square law response resulting from the diode rectification. The important point is if we double the RF voltage applied that the offset shift quadruples. Conversely, if we cut the RF applied in half, the offset drops to one quarter of the value. Measuring the EMIR at the input of the operational amplifier May, is relatively straightforward from a concept standpoint, but more difficult in reality. What we have is a simplified diagram of the test arrangement. We have a wideband RF generator at the input that we sweep across frequency. In our test, we sweep it from 10 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. We have a 50 ohm transmission line interfacing the generator with the amplifier under test. The output is followed by a low-pass filter, which filters any residual RF coupled across the die and prevents it from getting into the digital multimeter, which monitors the voltage offset at the output. The practical implementation of the EMIRR input test consists of a signal generator, some SMA cabling, a bias T, which allows this to actually change the common mode voltage on the input of the amplifier, then a precisely laid out printed circuit board. We have a very complex transmission line environment, especially as we move up in frequency. We have to maintain the voltage relatively constant at the input of the device. And so we go through a calibration procedure that takes into account all the reflections associated with this transmission line environment. Using this arrangement, we can measure the EMI RR of several of our modern CMOS operational amplifiers. Four different operational amplifiers have their EMIR performance across frequency shown in this plot. The OPA333 has a gain bandwidth of 350 kilohertz and includes a filter. The OPA378 has a bit wider bandwidth and includes an input filter. And the OPA376 with a 5.5 megahertz gain bandwidth has the input filter. The remaining device, the OPA348, has one megahertz gain bandwidth and does not include an input filter. The EMI RR performance of the four amplifiers is plotted on this graph. 
On this scale, we have EMI RR in decibels from 0 to 140 dB. And on the horizontal scale, we have frequency from 10 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. We see that for the OPA333, the one with the lowest gain bandwidth, that by the time we get to a few hundred megahertz, we have 120 dB of EMI RR. It's very high. For the OPA378, which has a higher gain bandwidth and a higher cutoff frequency for its internal filter, we see that it actually picks up a little later in frequency, but the filter action is evident. By the time we get to 1 gigahertz, we have almost 100 dB of EMI RR, once again very high. For most RF applications in the hundreds of megahertz and gigahertz, this is a very high level of EMI RR. The OPA376, which has the widest gain bandwidth, its internal filter doesn't cut off until a much higher frequency. And the roll-off becomes evident as we move up into the hundreds of megahertz. At 1 gigahertz, we have approximately 60 dB of an EMI RR, still quite high. The last amplifier, the OPA340, which does not have a filter, we can see that as we move across frequency, its EMI RR is pretty consistent and low, less than 20 dB. By the time we get to 1 gigahertz, it's a little higher, maybe 25 dB, and then it increases. This increase above 1 gigahertz is very common with many operational amplifiers. Now we're going to take a look at some actual EMI RR measurements on some operational amplifiers. On the test board, we have two operational amplifiers an OPA2211 bipolar operational amplifier that does not have a built in EMI filter and an OPA2188 CMOS operational amplifier that does have a built-in EMIR filter. They are configured in a gain of 100 each, and they, this is followed by a gain amplifier gain of 20 for an overall gain of 2,000. That interfaces with an NI MIDAC, which serves as an oscilloscope interface. On the screen, we have the virtual oscilloscope, and I have it set up with a sensitivity of 500 millivolts per division and an offset so that we can separate the two traces. Right now we're monitoring the DC output offset amplified by 2000 for each of the amplifiers. On the first trace is the OPA2211 bipolar operational amplifier that does not have an EMIR filter built in. The second trace is the OPA2188 which does have the EMIRR filter built in. This is a 470 megahertz family radio. And all I'm going to do is transmit or key the transmitter in close proximity to the board. And what we see is that the offset and the upper trace is changing by something on the order of 500 millivolts, while we see a very small change in the lower trace. If I increase the sensitivity on the lower trace, down to something like 50 millivolts per division, while the other remains at 500 millivolts, we see that now we can detect a small change, maybe on the order of 40 millivolts. So that this indicates that the OPA2188, with its built-in EMIR filter, has much less sensitivity to the applied 470 megahertz input. The EMIR our demonstration today was conducted using a wireless RF source. In many cases, the source may not be wireless, but if it is, the radiated field will be absorbed by our printed circuit board and the traces will act as antennas, conducting the EMIR to the input of our analog circuit. This is no substitute for good printed circuit board layout relative to RF considerations, but it is a tool that can be used in the event that EMIR may be an issue in your circuit. I hope this has been of some help to you today. For more information, please see the following websites.